Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 449, featuring part two of my interview with the fabulous Winston Douglas Wood, creator of the Fantasy series of computer role-playing games. Uh, in this segment, we talk more about fantasy, of course. We get into the way it handles experience points, uh, the combat, what sets it what set it apart from the other games of its time, the manuals, that lovely box art what it was like working for SSI, and how the Gold Box series changed the equation there. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Winston Douglas Wood. So what about the dialogue system? This is something I remember just from the Gold Box games, when you'd come across a group of monsters, it would pop up and say, would you like to parlay? You know, would you like to talk to the monsters? And, of course, you had that in your game well before that. You could try to talk monsters out of combat, I suppose, or bribe them. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was the something? Yeah. I guess it just seemed a little more fun and a little more realistic. Um, but I also remember, you know, it both in computer and tabletop games, just having your party get wiped out. And I thought, well, it'd be kind of nice to... <laughs> have the option to try and get, you know, get out of that. If you're really, really desperate, um, you can try and get out of it. Um, uh, seemed realistic and, and kind of fun. Gives your, your party a little character if they have to occasionally bribe their way out of something. And <laughs> yeah. I hate to have to do that. I think I saw an option in Star Command where you could impersonate a deity. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fun. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff from Star Command that I don't even remember. That is, <laughs> Sounds like something we might have done, but I don't remember. Well, the experience system is also different uh, than mm -hmm. what we see in other games uh, then and now. I was reading a <laughs> CRPG Addict. I don't know if you ever... Have you come across this stuff? CRPG Addict? Yeah, I've, I think I've been to the website a few times um, and, uh, you know, read read what he's got there. Uh, he loves your games. He loves stuff. fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to check it out again <laughs> it sounds like a good website for me yeah he's a good he's a good guy uh, one of the things he talks about in there is the the experience points and the way the xp works in fantasy mm -hmm. and this is something i hadn't thought a lot about but it is a it's pretty significant difference uh, so mm -hmm. if i understand this right uh, you get back to town, and then you just sort of have this pool of experience points, and you can decide how to distribute those uh, amongst your characters. Yeah, I think you can give some characters a little more or a little less than than just their share, uh, which I guess you could, you could, as a player, do one of two things. You could try and be a little more realistic and give the, the guys who had done the most work a little more experience. But mm -hmm. as you pointed out, you might just be have a new guy in the group and – because you figure you you needed uh, a minotaur in your party. <laughs> Who doesn't? You want to get him up to speed, so it's a nice way to give him uh, a little experience. Perhaps not realistic, but but kind of fun to be able to do that. The more I think about it, it's almost like you're putting the player in the position of the dungeon master there for a little bit. And you know, mm -hmm. a lot of dungeon masters won't just say, "Well, everybody gets such as you know this many experience points." They'll say, "Well, you know, you kind of role played a little better." <laughs> Right, right. You no, know, you kind of had a more fun. You kind of made the experience more fun for everybody. So I'm going to give <laughs> yeah. you. You know, it, it, it's not, it feels like that to me. Yeah, that, that's kind of the way it is. Uh, kind of a. Uh, yeah, I don't. I can't remember. I just thought it would be fun. I think. Yeah, I was thinking that's a problem in a lot of games. You know, a lot of people that watch this show also are interested or actively designing their own uh, computer right. role-playing games. Of course, this comes up a lot. And some of the games I've played, the idea is you don't get the experience points unless you actually land the killing blow on a monster. Right. And then other games will be, uh, you know, if your character's unconscious, you don't get, he gets knocked unconscious or something, you don't get any XP. And so there's uh -huh. a lot of different ways to to go about it, but... So, do you, would you, uh, if you're making a game now, would you want to have the same system? Probably. Uh, you know, it's just um, I, I don't know if if those additions really add much to the game. Um, the, 
trying to do it in a, in a more uh, fair way. I probably would just divide it evenly amongst everyone in the party. Uh, it was going maybe a little too far to, to <laughs> let you give someone more who didn't deserve it. But, uh, I, yeah, I think the fairest thing to do is just to divide it evenly. Um, it's the fairest and funnest thing to do, I guess. Well, one of the, the <clears throat> another thing that comes up is the uh, in the reviews is the idea of the, using these scrolls uh, that you find. You find scrolls in the game, and that's sort of how you learn about the backstory and you know bigger picture things and narrative, <laughs> basically. Uh, you know, of course, the gold box games they, they sort of do the same thing, but now it's in a printed journal, and I'll say you got to look up you know page <laughs> twelve to, to read this. <laughs> As I just think it's kind of fascinating. Just for one, just in the terms of a nar- putting a narrative into a game, how do you do it? You know, especially at this era, uh, so you opted for this scroll system. And somebody was pointing out, I don't remember if it was one of the comments or where they were saying this, but they like the Elder Scrolls series kind of follows your in your footsteps with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, just what, what do you think about the this sort of system for telling a story? Yeah, I, I guess it just was seemed like a great idea at the time um, because you want to get a lot of storytelling in but the resources on of the Apple are just so limited mm-hmm. uh, that this opportunity to, to present a lot of text in a, in a way that kind of you know, logically makes sense uh, was pretty straightforward and uh, it was easy to do with the Apple. Um, so I really had to, to pay attention to resources in terms of the RAM of the computer and the amount of space that was being taken up on the floppy drive. Uh, to go to it, to add an extra floppy, it was just something well, That's messy. amazing to think. That, like you Not were down to like that. worrying about a line of text uh-huh. might put you over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, literally a couple of the scrolls, um, I I had to to reduce it. Normally they take up one page of text, which mm-hmm. is kind of a small amount in those days on the Apple II. But uh, some of them actually used less than a page, and I had to just figure out how that was how if I saved this file only three quarters of it or half of it. Where is it going to put that text on the page? It wasn't just uh, the way you would expect to fill up the top half. It would put random lines of text, and I had to use those and make a scroll that <laughs> out, out of these uh, random lines of text. And some of them, some places I couldn't put text because it wouldn't it wouldn't show up. So it was wow. Just, so you wouldn't expect of, something like that to be that challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I literally used every single sector on the uh, floppy drive, uh, and that's why I had to, some of those scrolls had to be cut down by a sector or two. Uh, and sectors were really small in those days, so uh, it was a challenge. But I, it was a good use of of the space. I think that it's a good storytelling device mm-hmm. and fun, and uh, I think it worked out well. Yeah, a lot of people think that's the best part of the games. Or at least, yeah, really. I, I think the way I saw it put was you're missing out on a lot of the fun of the game if you uh, try to skip over those. Yeah. Uh, so I guess you were doing a lot of wordsmithing, a lot of editing, like, how can I say this yeah. in fewer words, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, so one thing that you uh, don't think about, in addition to, you know, it's 1982 or whatever, you, you don't have the Internet. Uh, that's one of your limitations. If I had to send a, a new disk to SS, I had to run to the store and, and FedEx it to them. And a phone call is really expensive. It's a dollar a minute to call them during... A dollar uh, a minute? Wow. That's probably yeah. about $1,000 well, a minute. Up to, yeah. <laughs> uh, to call them. Uh, and there's all sorts of limitations. Um, but one of what this, one of them was that I did not have any word processor. It, the Apple II didn't come with one, and I didn't have one, and so I had to create these scrolls and uh, the dungeons. Um, everything, I had to write the tools to create them as well. And, um, of course, there was no spell check. 
I, I hired someone to <laughs> check all the spelling. Uh, but uh, I, I particularly remember having to write some sort of rudimentary word processing capabilities into the scroll uh, and dungeon uh, creating utilities. Well, that's cool that you hired somebody to <laughs> check the spelling. Uh, kind of a little yeah. thing, but I still find spelling errors in a lot of even modern games. And you think, well, you know, you probably should have had somebody look at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. SSI caught a few, but. Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering, Doug, did, were they, was there the any talk about spell. maybe you should move some of this into a printed journal so we can. You know, no. kind of do a copy protection thing. No, no, I'm surprised that uh, the gold box games didn't uh, didn't do scrolls the way I did. I thought it worked real well. As I recall, that was their excuse: was well, we don't have enough memory in the Commodore to put the the text in there. But hmm. Yeah, well, kind of like was I was struggle. doing it with Apple too. So <laughs> it was a struggle for sure on the Apple. Uh, so some of the reviews they they complain about. Uh, the game's inventory and the distributing items systems. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what the problem is. I guess maybe a little bit cumbersome. I, I don't know. I uh, just wonder what your thoughts are. Did you feel like there's some problems with the way the game handles uh, inventory? Actually, I remember once or twice getting compliments on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was easy when you came back from an adventure and you had a bunch of stuff and you wanted to distribute it. It, it worked well for that. And if you were just in town and you had a whole bunch of stuff that you just bought or whatever and you wanted to just redistribute everything throughout your whole party, I think it worked pretty well. But it may not have worked as well if you just wanted to move one item. Uh, I can't remember what the limitations were. But uh, on the whole, I thought it was kind of fun and, and yeah. uh, worked pretty well. You know, sometimes I feel like these reviewers just feel like they, they got to find something to complain right. about, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was a, this kind of caught me by surprise. Mm -hmm. So in that RPG Codex interview, you were saying that you know you had this game, you're shopping it out, trying to find a publisher, and that ten different publishers rejected the game. Yeah. I mean, good God, <laughs> did they? Yeah. How do these people uh, earn their paychecks? <laughs> You know, I guess probably it was the quality of the graphics. Uh, like I said, I thought I thought it communicated well. I thought it was fun to see all that stuff, uh, and I thought it worked really well, communicated well, and told the story well. But it was not as polished as even even by early '80s Apple II standards, it wasn't as polished as some. And I think that's probably what hurt it. Yeah, I was thinking 80. This was it must have been before the 85, though, right? This would have been... When were you shopping it around? Yeah, uh, probably 83, 84. Wow. Yeah, so you hadn't seen... The, uh, Bard's Tell wouldn't have been out at that point. I was just no, trying to think, Bard, like, what would have been the most polished-looking CRPG? Yeah, Bard's Tale was definitely graphically uh, polished, and um, I guess maybe Ultima 4, you know, mm -hmm. was, was pretty slick, and so why did SSI pick it up? Um, probably my understanding, 84. they hadn't done any role-playing games until... They had done it. Questron. Questron. Uh, which I, they never gave me a copy of it, so I don't know exactly uh, yeah, how it worked. I, on the it may have been a, a single-player game. Uh, not, not a, That's the uh, one that got sued by the Origin, right? They thought it was too similar. Or did they got a license uh, or something? Yeah, similar to Ultima 1, oh. Ultima 2. Uh, again, I didn't ever play it, but um, they um, they seemed to think that it was a, a big success for them, and um, I guess it inspired them to, to look at fantasy. Um and it fantasy became their uh, all-time bestseller for a while until mm -hmm. the gold box games came out. So it was a uh, a good move for the, for SSI. Do you still have your copies, your your boxes? Yeah, yeah. Right here on my shelf is uh, this shelf here is all different. Uh, nice. 
Yeah, it says I love the artwork Different on those platforms. fantasy games. Fantasy one, two, and three. Yeah, uh, they came. They did good boxes, I have to say, and good manuals. Yeah, there's Wrath of Nicodemus up there. <laughs> yeah, really, really just gorgeous artwork. I, I'm a big fan of the <laughs> fantasy art. <laughs> I did a good yeah, job. Yeah, they did a good job. Yeah. So I've had a lot of folks on from that worked at SSI. Hmm. You know, around the time of Joel Billings, Susan Manley, David Shelley, Laura Bowen. You know, it goes on. I'm just wondering, like, did you enjoy working with these folks? Uh, did you did you go? Were you working there, or was it all? You mentioned mailing a disc, so you, oh, you, know, uh, you might not have first, had. A, yeah, the first time I. Um, ever met anyone from SSI was after Fantasy after Star Command came out. Wow. Uh, when I was uh, negotiating a contract for Fantasy 4 between SSI, myself and a Japanese company called Second Brain. Oh, Second uh, Brain? Huh? Yeah. I think they had uh, a couple of different names, but that was the one that, that uh, they told me about that. Uh, and uh, they had done the Japanese versions of Fantasy 1, 2, and 3, and they wanted to hire me to do a design for 4. And uh, that was the first time I met anyone from SSI. And um, so I met Joel Billings for, for one minute in his office. <laughs> that was it. Uh, what? So you're like their, their, their key <laughs> developer? And they're like, oh, well. I'll give you a minute. <laughs> I guess they, by that time they'd moved on to, they were developing the gold box games, I think maybe. But uh, I worked a lot with Chuck Krogel uh, mm. on the business aspects of things. And um, I think David Shelley did a lot of work on Star Command. Uh, and maybe a few people you haven't mentioned, but. From SSI, the person who gave me the greatest creative input was Keith Broers on on Fantasy One. We've got to get him on the show somehow. <laughs> I found I've wanted him for a long time. He did a lot. Of, I think I think he ended up doing a lot of the development of the Gold Box games. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not positive about that. I think I've emailed him a couple times, but I don't know, right. some people don't like to do the whole video thing. I guess. So. I'll yeah, find a I'm, way. I'm we'll get him. Intimidated by myself. <laughs> so you said you hadn't played Questron. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you ne never played it? No, I don't think I ever played it. Uh, one thing they they said was Questron has this great ending. Mm -hmm. uh, when you finally solve the the game and and, and you get to the ending, it's uh, this big sequence of events. And they said you really should do something like that for fantasy. And so I I did. Uh, it did make the ending a lot fancier, um, you know, get again within the limitations of the graphics that I had. But uh, that was one one way that Questron influenced fantasy. Yeah, I remember talking to the uh, developer of Shard of Spring. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who that, I'm blanking on the name again. Uh, but anyway, I remember he was telling me that things kind of changed at SSI after the gold box after they got that license and you know he felt kind right. of kind of marginalized i guess for lack of a better word like it just wasn't like all of their focus and resources like on the D, &D license stuff you kind of feel the same way or yeah i'd say that's that's pretty accurate um i i think there was a big shift in focus and uh you know it, it definitely became a good seller for them so um and I said, you know, I, I noticed you've got this license. Uh, if, if you want my input, let me know. And I never heard back on that. Oh. So uh, they had some good people there, though, so they did a good job with it. You know, I hate but, asking uh, you about other people's games, you know, but, uh, you know, have you played the Gold Box games? Would you have done, were there things you like, I, oh, I would have done that different? They didn't send me Questron, but they sent me uh, the Gold Box, the first one, and it was pretty good. Yeah, I, I mean, it was uh, it was well well done. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it had a lot of people working on it. Oh, as sure. To just one, uh, and it it was good. Uh, no, no complaints about it. So you were when you were making your your games. Was it mostly just you, or did you have? A, it sound like you had at least a couple of people helping. I had um, 
a couple of play testers um, that were, you know, friends in the neighborhood and uh, family members, my cousin. Uh, with with Fantasy One, a friend of mine, uh, Chris Conley, should be mentioned because he was like, Re- "You really need to do this," and he was really encouraging, yeah. and it was an extensive play Those tester. People are important. Yeah, yeah. And they're the people, the same people that I play D and D with a lot. And, uh, but no, I, I didn't have any um, technical help at all. Did you find ways to put your D and D buddies into the into the <laughs> game, like uh, Lord British did? <laughs> did I do that? I'd say no. I, I didn't get any requests for that, <laughs> um, except Nicodemus. I got put that character in, but I made him change him from a good character to a bad character. Let's see, Fantasy 2, then, that comes out in 1986. Mm-hmm. You know, and some people were saying, well, this is it's a great game, but it's basically similar to the first game. They didn't see a lot of major changes or anything. I'm always kind of curious about this, like, why should it be <laughs> so different? You know, it's a sequel, right? Right, right. Uh, well, it, yeah. uh, at that time, SSI did a lot of war games. And they always came out in a series of three, and they would kind of develop their their game platform, uh, the game system, or whatever you want to call it, and really just release three games that were pretty much identical, but with different settings. Um, and so that's what they said: Hey, this is what we always do. We don't make a lot of you know changes. Um, so. Yeah, that's what you should do with Fantasy 2. I said, okay, well, they must know what they're talking about, and that's what I did. Uh, and then with Fantasy 3, they were like, you know, we got a little criticism on Fantasy 2 because it was exactly like <laughs> Fantasy 1 in terms of the game engine. And yeah. maybe you should make some more drastic changes, and so I did. And I agreed with them, too. It was it was fun to go in and make you know improvements. And um, Fantasy 2, I think, was a good game. I think the plot was... Uh, one of the strongest, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it was pretty much identical in terms of gameplay. It's got a rock, rock throwing mechanic. I think was yeah. <laughs> What's this all about? Rock, rock throwing rocks. <laughs> I guess if you don't have any other uh, uh, ranged weapon, that was the thing. Or maybe I, I, I can't remember if there were ranged weapons. I I honestly don't remember. It, but it was something that was in Fantasy Two that you could. Uh, do as a range weapon. So if you weren't in, uh, you know, melee combat range, you could th- you could throw a rock. <laughs> it sounds like. And I think uh, more stuff came up in Fantasy Three. You know, there was a lot of innovations in Fantasy Three, but uh, I guess that <laughs> tells you there wasn't much difference between Fantasy <laughs> Two. <laughs> Throwing rocks is. That's one, one of, of those big... things. I remember playing some of these games, and you're like, "Well, why? Surely I could, you know, a tabletop game." Like, well, you you don't have a ranged weapon. Well, I'm just going to pick up a rock and throw it at him, you know? It's, it's, is that I kind guess. of... <laughs> is that the inspiration? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess you, I didn't have to add a, a whole inventory of ranged weapons and do a lot. It was just uh, oh, just yeah. one, one option. Yeah, just in terms of RPG design, then you, got, then you get into, like, ammunition and... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what happens when you run out? <laughs> yeah. Let's see, was there anything else about Fantasy 2? Oh, uh, one thing about Fantasy 2 I noticed was that it has, it's, that's the one that has the highest score on Moby Games. Uh, for what that's worth. I... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, like I said, I, uh, some people like the plot, uh, the best of the, of the games. Mm. Um, that's usually what stands the test of time, isn't it? The... I guess, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's that's probably it. Uh, what about the plot? Do you think makes that one stand out? <laughs> um, I guess it was just it, it was just coherent. It was designed, uh, you know, from the very beginning mm-hmm. with plot in mind. Whereas uh, Fantasy One was developed a little more uh, in steps, and and then, like I said, SSI gave me a lot of 
help on the plot, but it did make it a little more piecemeal, you know, um, and not as coherent as the one in Fantasy II. Um, he kind of reminds me some of the late, latest series of interviews I did where a lot of the designers worked on the modules or the expansion packs uh, for games like mm-hmm. Neverwinter Nights. And, and one of the things that sh- I'd never really thought about this before, uh, but they're saying actually you're better off when you're making one of those modules or expansions because the engine's done. Right. You know, you could just focus on, like, writing a great story with characters and all this stuff. And, you know, I kind of wondered if it was a similar thing between Fantasy 1 and 2, because you, know, you had most of that programming stuff done at that point, right? Right, right, yeah. I think that does help. You know exactly what uh, what your abilities are in terms of uh, what you can make happen to the characters, what sort of situations you can put them in, and... Um, yeah, you can just kind of concentrate on that from the very beginning. Let's get into the third fantasy, Fantasy Three: Wrath of Nicodemus, nineteen eighty-seven. Mm-hmm. You know, we'd already you already said there's some big changes with this one. You know, mm-hmm. I got a lot of uh, questions from the audience about this one. You know, we got the you can move your characters around. You've got some differences with the way you can aim, uh, spells and things, these different ranks. Uh, Carl Jung wants to know about the limb loss system. So what's mm-hmm. the sort of the story behind that and why, in your opinion, uh, Doug, do mm-hmm. you think so few modern games simulate limb loss and other grievous injuries? <laughs> That's all for this uh, week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week with the third installment. Probably have at least uh, at least one more for sure, but maybe two more installments. We'll see uh, how things go. Got a lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned. And as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much uh, for your continued support of the show, for keeping these episodes coming. You guys are completely awesome uh, so thank you uh, so much for that uh, i am uh, tweak- uh tweaking uh the credits a little bit to put some pictures in there and some other fun stuff so uh trying to give a little back uh, you know I, I realize a lot of folks are having some very difficult financial troubles right now and uh, matt chat not being uh, the top priority for obvious reasons but uh you know if things are uh, if, you know if you're doing fine or if things are, are looking better you know please do consider uh, going to that Patreon site and signing up for an account. Uh, become one of the Retrons. <laughs> I think you'll get a lot more out of the show. Uh, you'll really enjoy it. But, you know, again, you know, I understand times are tough. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, <laughs> this is from Matt W. Uh, Tesla. Uh, you know, I don't know what's up with this guy. <laughs> it's kind of wacky. <laughs> uh, anyway, they have uh, decided to put a an arcade system into these Teslas. I guess it was in there all along, but now you can actually, uh, uh, you know, they're sort of revealing how to access this thing. It uses the steering wheel and the brake. In conjunction with a, like this buggy, uh, buggy boy kind of arcade game, uh, it's in all the models. And uh, this art, uh, this this uh, video rather is kind of interesting because they talk about some of the quote unquote safety features to keep you from, uh, you know, getting into an accident while you're playing one of these games. But man, <laughs> you know, I think we should file this under the uh, rubric of what could possibly go wrong. <laughs> They're actually saying in this video that. Uh, when you exit out of the game, it j- sort of jumps back into full control of the vehicle. Uh, I don't know. This just seems crazy to me. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Weirder things have happened. Maybe they can work out the, the kinks in this. But, you know, it, it doesn't really inspire much confidence. Uh, second bit of news. This is really cool. Uh, Knights of the Chalice 2. So you remember a while back I covered the first game. Uh, really, really great stuff if you are a fan of that classic style 
uh, but want a more modern uh, take on it, you can check these out. Uh, the first one, I forget when it came out, but it's been around for a while. Uh, but anyway, uh, they're doing part two now, the Augury of Chaos. So your heroic party confronting a group of evil fanatics allied with various demons and dragons. 700 spells, spike pits, uh, use your guile or crush them with your sword. Uh, so it's using the Open Gaming License 3.5 uh, for the basis of this. They even have a Conan reference oh, here. Uh, so I'll link to this. You can watch the trailer over at Game Banshee, read a little bit more about it. I am, uh, you know, I've emailed the developer a few times. So he seems like a nice guy, a, a little bit shy, I guess, about the videos. Uh, hopefully he will respond this time. We can actually get him on the show. <laughs> so, uh, it can be a bit challenging sometimes, but I, you know, I would like to talk to him. He seems like a really interesting guy. Uh, and he looks like a lot of fun in this video. Uh, so anyway, I'll try to keep you posted on that. I'll hopefully have him on the show at some point anyway. Uh, last bit of news, if you are a fan of the old uh, uh, Sierra game Space Quest, uh, somebody has done a prequel to that called Space Quest, A Son of Z uh, Xenon, Xenon? <laughs> uh, developed by Boston McShoe. Uh, so he used Adventure Construction Set, what do they call that, Adventure Game Studio? <laughs> well, I went a little old school there for a second. Uh, to make this non-profit fan-made adventure game with the look of Space Quest 3, with uh, 3 20 by 200 EGA graphics. So you can download this. Let's see if they talk about the story here. Uh, we get to know the hard, hardworking smart Roger, a true son of Xenon. Roger spends the first part of the game, other chapters will follow, in his office and studio apartment. When Roger, ending up in a bar, meets a woman who is simply too gorgeous to be true, Hey, wait a minute, is this Space Quest or Leisure Suit Larry? Uh, anyway, the story of love and betrayal unfolds, and so begins the story of Space Quest's son of Xenon. Download it for free, so you can't beat that. Anyway, that will do it for the news. Uh, why don't we wrap up with a quote, as <laughs> I want to do. As I was looking up uh, quotes about experience, because we talked a little bit about experience points, and... You know, it is kind of an interesting thing to think about, like, what, is, what exactly is experience, you know, what does that mean, how does that work? Uh, so I found this quote from Immanuel Kant, or Kant, you know, however you want to pronounce that, the philosopher, and of course he's got a lot to say on the topic, uh, but here's a little quote that I think is very interesting. It goes something like this, experience without theory is blind, but theory without experience is mere intellectual play. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. Oh, please, Miss Stoneman, there's no reason to be disturbed. That's right. Behind our masks, we're perfectly ordinary people.